Well, hello everyone, welcome back. We are just about wrapping up our journey with this Bible study called Following Jesus During Holy Week. And today is Friday. And if you remember where we left off yesterday, it was the Passover dinner. The disciples and Jesus had finished up and they had made their way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we pick it up today, Pastor. Can you tell us about what was going on? Yeah, you know, Thursday of Holy Week runs into Friday. I mean, you know, basically the events don't stop. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus goes with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, short walk uh, over into the Garden of Gethsemane. At that point in time, wasn't really a garden. It was really a, a place where olive oil was made. Uh, Gethsemane, the word itself, means olive press. And that in and, in and of itself carries great significance mm -hmm. to what's going on there in the garden. Uh, and Jesus uh, gets to the garden. I know the disciples start noticing that he is changing. He, he actually come, takes Peter, James, and John, goes a little deeper into the, into the place that they're at there in the garden. And he tells them to watch and pray. He actually tells them, you know, you could say it in our vernacular, I guess, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying. Mm -hmm. Watch and pray with me. Well, uh, you know, after four glasses of wine or more at the Passover meal, the disciples struggle with that. But Jesus goes and he begins to struggle. The Bible tells us uh, the struggle was so intense that he uh, sweat great drops of blood, you know. So think about the olive press. I mean, I mean, there you see our, our, the source, you could say, of anointing, mm -hmm. Jesus, being pressed, pressed in this place by, by the events of of the world and carrying the sin of the world on his shoulders. And, uh, you know, he goes back to the disciples a couple of times and asks them, could they not watch him pray even one hour? And uh, it's not long after that that Judas shows up again with a, with a detachment of uh, temple soldiers and, and just a group of people there to arrest him. Yeah, I find that interesting too that... Uh... You know, they all show up with, with weapons and torches. It's, you know, it's like going to be a, a mob mentality. And, yeah. and Jesus addresses that with them. They say, have you come out mm -hmm. with all of these weapons? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Jesus commented on that, like you said. Mm -hmm. He said, well, who are you coming out to arrest? You know, mm -hmm. somebody that's inciting a rebellion. You know, he said, I was with you daily in the temple. That's right. And uh, I, I'm not inciting a rebellion at all. Uh, he's inciting a revolution, but a spiritual one, right. a restoration of the souls of men. And then, of course, hot-headed Peter, <laughs> what does he do? He, he decides he's going to fight, right? So he whips out the sword. And yeah, you know, Peter, get, well, Peter gets a lot of flack for some of the mistakes that he's made in his life, but, but I really do believe Peter loved Jesus very mm -hmm. much. Uh, he just didn't understand the depth of his own weaknesses. Um, you know, he said, I'll, I'll die with you. Uh, I think Peter just tries to fight to defend. He, he doesn't know what's going on there. He, ha he really has no idea. Yeah. And uh, Jesus, you know, corrects him and says, uh, you know, you need to allow these events to transpire. This is the will of God. And then Peter enters the picture again because as the story goes, they take Jesus to the high priest, the courtyard of Caiaphas. And Peter's following him at a distance, and then he gets real close in the courtyard. And what happens there? Well, you know, we've actually been able to walk up those steps there when we've gone to, to Jerusalem. The actual steps that Jesus walked mm -hmm. up to go to Caiaphas' house, it's really surreal, uh, a very powerful moment. But when they get there, uh, you know, the, all the religious leadership has gathered together uh, they knew this event was happening, and they take Jesus there, and as they're trying to put together a case against Jesus to, for his death, Peter's going through his own trial. Uh, two or three people, it's actually three, during the time uh, that he's there, uh, say, you were with Jesus, you were with Jesus, and he denies it. Uh, he denies it and says, I don't know the man. And even at the very end, the Bible tells us he actually cursed to show us, to, to, to be emphatically say 
that he did not know the Lord. I think that's such a powerful thing for all of us because in every single one of us, even followers of Christ at time, have, we've, we've denied him mm -hmm. in actions or something mm -hmm. when we could have stood up for him. So I think all of us can relate to Peter, uh, you know, in his failure. And so later in the day, they convict Jesus, uh, the Sanhedrin and the high priest, and, mm -hmm. and they take him uh, before uh, Pontius Pilate. Yeah. And so there's kind of a, a almost like a mock trial going on because they know what they're going to do. Yeah. They know what they yeah. want to do, right? Exactly. They can't put Jesus to death themselves. Uh, but So they need Pilate's complicity here. You know, the whole interaction with Pilate is one of my favorite things in the Bible, Jesus' interaction with Pilate. I, 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 just, I just love it. You know, here's Jesus as a prisoner, and, uh, you know, Pilate begins to ask Jesus questions, and, and Jesus actually begins to question Pilate uh, about how he's doing his job. I mean, he says, you know, are you just believing what, have you investigated this yourself? In other words, is really what Jesus is saying. Are you just following along with what other people have said? And, and so here we see, even in the midst of being a prisoner here, Jesus is in absolute control of this situation. I mean, Pilate even asked Jesus, he said, don't you realize I have the power to set you free or the power to crucify you? And Jesus looks at Pilate and says, you have no power over me. Uh, an amazing, amazing statement. But as we know, um, Pilate gets caught in the same trap, basically, that the scribes and the Pharisees are in, which is, you know, trying to save his own political career. And, and he condemns Jesus to be crucified. And it's interesting that he washes his hands of his death. He washes his hands basically showing that he's not in agreement with it. But he allows it to happen. And so, uh, you know, I think sometimes we try to metaphorically wash our hands on, of things that, uh, and try to distance ourselves away from them. When in reality, like Pilate, you know, we're, we're just as much a part of decisions that are being made there because that thing could not go forward without Pilate's agreement. Right. And so now we have Jesus who's been condemned to death to be hung on a tree, which yes. as you know, in, in the Old Testament, that was considered a curse. Yes, it was. And so he is carrying his cross, carrying the cross that he will be crucified on up to Calvary. Yes, yes he does. How, what do you think was going on in the minds of the disciples at this point? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, if I were one of them, uh, probably abject fear and um, confusion. Uh, here we go. They see this man who they know has the power to be able to stop this. I mean, this is a guy who could stop the winds and the waves from blowing. It's a guy who could raise the dead to life. And I'm, I'm sure that the confusion is just massively attacking their hearts as they watch him submit to this process. Never once does he use the power that he has to stop it. Um, the disciples are pretty much broken. They've scattered most of them at this point in time. I think basically only, only the teenage disciple John is still with him. Mm -hmm. and still following him all the way to, the, to Calvary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is on the cross yeah. in between two others, and he talks to one of the thieves. Yes, he does. What, what is, what's the interaction that takes place? Very powerful. Very, very powerful. You know, uh, I think, I love this story too, because I think all of us can relate to that one thief. I mean, here's a guy uh, that, is already paying for, for his life of sin. He has no hope to be able to come off of that cross and live a different life. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked Jesus to forgive him. What a, what a statement of faith and what a picture of faith that is. Like I said, this, this guy can't be forgiven and come down and live a new life. He has to exercise faith that when Jesus says he's forgiven, that he's going to go from that place of condemnation into heaven. Jesus said, 
I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. The word paradise is a very interesting word. It's, a, it's an old Persian word that means a walled garden. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is basically saying, today you'll be, you'll be with me in the garden. And that's a message for us as well. Mm -hmm. How often do we look at that circumstance and, and we question our own faith? Well, do we really believe that we're forgiven? Yeah. And you look at this thief that's on the cross and he really, he really believed. He did, and we can all take heart from that. I mean, if you've ever struggled with believing that Jesus could forgive you for what you've done, take heart from what you see from the thief on the cross and Jesus' interaction with him. The answer to that is yes, you can. Mm. Yes, you can. Right, and then the final moments, the final moments of Jesus' life, uh, physical life, he utters the words, it is finished. It's finished. Yeah. What do you... What, Tell us about that. Powerful words. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't just imply the fact, hey, my life is over. It, it's talking about the, the price to pay our redemption is complete. Amen. Basically what Jesus is saying, paid in full. He's basically saying everything that you have ever done, every, every sin you've ever committed, I have covered forgiven and broken the power of them to determine your eternal destiny. Very, very awesome thing and comforting words to all of us. Right. Yeah. And then as we know from the story, the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies rents top to bottom. Tears in two. And if you study the curtain, of course, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, we right. could sit here all day and talk about this. The curtain was extremely thick and very, very heavy. And for that to rip in two must have made a sound like, oh my goodness, it must have made an incredible sound. But basically what's happening there is God is saying the way into the presence of God, which was restricted before, has been opened for all mankind. And so now Jesus dies. He breathes his last breath and he gives up his spirit. And then they remove his body from the tomb, I mean from the cross, and they, they take him to a tomb, yes. it's Joseph Arimathea. And they seal the tomb. Yeah. And then there was some concern on the mm -hmm. part of the, the high priest and yeah. the scribes and the, and the Sadducees that yeah. to continue this, what they considered a, a conspiracy, that mm -hmm. they were afraid someone was going to steal Jesus' body from the tomb. So yeah. what happened? How did they, how did they uh, address that? Well, they went to Pilate and asked uh, for a guard. And they asked for Pilate to seal the tomb. Uh, and, you know, Pilate's seal on the tomb was basically the Roman authority, which, bas which said, this, is, this cannot be moved, this cannot be touched. And he even gave them a guard to guard a dead man. I'm sure Pilate thought that was a little bit strange. But at this point in time, he's just into appeasing these religious leaders. And uh, uh, they put the guard on the tomb. And that leads us toward the events that happen in a couple of days. Very good. So Jesus is laying in the tomb. Mm -hmm. It's been sealed, not just with a, with a large boulder, but also with the Roman authority. Yes, it is. And so by all accounts, there's no way anyone could get in, and there's no way a human could get out. It's, it's done. By all accounts, it's done. Mm -hmm. From a human standpoint, from uh, uh, any other standpoint that you could look at, uh, he, he's in there and he's not going anywhere. Well, that wraps up Friday and Saturday. We hope that you've enjoyed this series called Following Jesus During Holy Week. It's been quite a week. It's been a great week, and uh, you know, but it doesn't end today. And so, Join us Sunday morning. We're going to take another trip back to that tomb on Sunday. And the most amazing thing in the history of mankind happens there. So join us Sunday at 10 a.m. and we'll talk about it. And as you put it, this is the only invitation that can change lives. That's right. This is the invitation that can change everything for you. It can change everything, just like it did for that thief on the cross. God is ready to intervene in your life just like he did in that thief. You know, Jesus wasn't so tied up in his own life at that point in time. 
that he forgot about what was going on with others because he did what he did for others, for you and for I. And so, man, the story does not end today. It, it, it's, a, it's a very important part of the story today, but it doesn't end. There's more to it. And the, one of the most exciting things, as I said, in the history of mankind happens Sunday morning. I can't wait. No, you, I you can't either. wait. I can't wait, you brother. Either. Well, thank you, Pastor Parkey. Thank you, we man. Love I you. love you. Yeah, and we love you all. We and love we all will, of you. We will see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. We're, st uh, we're streaming live, yes, of course, on our Facebook page. You're also on the website, www.capstone.church. And also, you can, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can check us out there. It's good to see you. We'll see you tomorrow. We love you. God bless you. God bless. Yeah.